first question I want to ask you, uh, to not not even a little bit of foreplay, is what is your definition of the meaning or purpose of our lives? Okay, easy. So, yeah, the <laughs> I'll give two answers actually. So the a lot of people have asked me this, especially students. They'll say, "I'm trying to find the meaning of life, or what's my purpose?" And it's stressful for most people. So a lot of times people are asking because um, they have this idea that there's supposed to be discovering some magic purpose, uh, but they, it's super important. It's their life's purpose, but they don't know what it is, and they, but they have to do it. So this is just a setup for stress, right? Uh, and I don't think that it's true. I think this is just a, I actually think it's part of our, our ego trying to determine what am I supposed to be doing? I think that's what the question really is. <laughs> but the question is asked from a spiritual perspective. People are well-intentioned and they want to know, like, I'm, I'm here, I want to live my life in a beautiful way. If there's something that I'm supposed to be doing as a spirit, I want to do that. So the, the intention is really nice, but I think the question itself is, is kind of um, stressful for most people. And um, because I, I think the answer is really simple. I think that the purpose of life is life, right? So I think we're here to live. We're here to, like, I'm here to create a, a joyful and happy experience for myself and then for everybody else too. Or like he, what Isami likes to say, my wife Isami, she likes to say, uh, create happy memories. So that's, you know, if you think of that as my, my purpose today is to create happy memories, that's going to be a really good day. I'm going to enjoy it myself. I'm going to do things for other people that they're going to enjoy. And I think it's as simple as that. I don't think there's, um, I don't think it needs to be more complicated because uh, we just kind of get stuck in our, uh, our programs are in our mind otherwise. So are there certain, let's call it bumper lanes or guidelines that you generally give to people uh, when they are like higher level students as far as what, what are ways that we can help create more happy memories, uh, especially in the tougher times? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so yeah, I don't differentiate much between beginning students and uh, advanced students, <laughs> except in the sense that, you know, I used to have a beginning class when I was teaching intuition. In person, I had a beginning class, an intermediate class, and somebody asked what the difference was. And I said, well, the difference is, you know, in the beginning class, we can go a little faster because in the advanced class, everybody has an idea that they're advanced and there's a lot of stuff we have to work through and kind of release first. <laughs> so <laughs> the beginners are really just ready to start. There's this idea that I, I don't know what I'm doing. And so, you know, open to learn and grow. <laughs> so I love it. But, I love it. <laughs> but um, so what would I tell them to uh, as kind of guidelines to be happy? Uh, mostly it's about not thinking too much. So we, we know we can feel inherently what makes us happy. And if you just follow that, kind of follow your gut or your intuition or your emotions, that's a, it's a very easy guide. And it's also, a lot of times people get confused with intuition too and think that intuition is, um, uh, most people think that it's a question when they receive it rather than an answer. So for example, today I um, I, I was walking through the, the bathroom and I happened to, my eyes happened to glance over and I saw this little uh, vitamin that I take sometimes. And right away my mind said, oh, should I take that because I saw it? But I know that this wasn't a question. The reason my eyes flicked over and saw it was today's a good day to take it. So you just open it, you know, take one and just move on. It doesn't really require that mental part. That's the part that gets in the way of going in easy direction and also in the way of just making those happy memories and kind of living uh, our life in a joyful way rather than, um, you know, a stressful, it's, it's funny. It's like in a thoughtful way rather than a thinking way, maybe is a good way to say it. So that's kind of the guidelines I'd give people is as much as possible, try to, try to relax. And it's easy for me to say because my mind's very active. So that's the journey I've been on. <laughs> mm. And you said you used to teach classes on intuition and I'm assuming like the overarching principle is what you just said right there, which is, we get these inspirations or these coincidences that happen. Can you elaborate on that? Um, so for the intuition classes, you mean, or? Or 
let me ask it uh, an even more interesting question. How can we tune into that intuition? Are there guidelines for that, like simple guidelines? Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. So the the tools I usually teach, uh, I learned them at a school called Psychic Horizon Center in, in Boulder, Colorado, but they originally came out of uh, Berkeley Psychic Institute in Berkeley, California in the 70s. And they're, the tools really help with your intuition because it kind of turns down the noise. So we work on we work on grounding, just getting really present in the body, because if you're if you're present here in your body, suddenly all the information you need is available. It's really quite amazing, and so that's just a really simple technique. And you can get grounded by going into nature, uh, eating your favorite food, doing things you love. All these things are naturally grounding and help you be really present. Uh, so that's the that's the first thing. The second thing is turning down the mental noise. What I mentioned already is knowing that your mind is very active and it's great. There's nothing wrong with the mind, but your mind is not great for making decisions. It's good for filling in the blanks. If you have missing information, your mind can make up a story that, you know, kind of fits the curve of what you do know. doesn't mean that story is true and it's not really the best thing to make decisions on. So if you want to use, you want to make a decision, you want to kind of turn that down and then just feel which way am I drawn to go, even though I don't know why? Uh, which is the thing that feels like I, I don't want to do it, even though I think I have to? Okay, well, I'm going to let that one go. So those are kind of two, the two main things. There's more, of course. You know, There's more mm-hmm. tools you can use to get more present. But those are the two big ones, being really present in the moment, in the body, and then letting the mind relax. Hmm. So before I get into the intense questions... What is your, to kind of set up for people who are maybe meeting you for the first time in this, what's your mission or quest in life right now? What, how are you, you said, you know, kind of maybe the, maybe the meaning of life is to just live and create happy memories for yourself and for, for everyone else. So I'm guessing that you're actively trying to create happy memories for other people in some form or fashion. And and how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, there's. Even though I said that that's the best, you know, when you think of the big picture, you know, what's the meaning of life? What's my purpose? I think having it very simple like that, uh, it's just to be happier to live is really good. But it's also nice to have goals and things you're working on kind of uh, if you're not taking them too seriously. (laughs) And so for me, Mm -hmm. what that looks like is uh, this, the planet right now, the time frame we live in it, we're going through a big change. We're changing from a kind of the way things have been or like an older energy into a new energy where things are moving a little bit faster. Um, there's not so much rigidity. There's not so much uh, kind of scarcity. We're moving into a space of more abundance. And w- this transition is taking a, quite a number of years, but it's the big curve that we're going through in my lifetime. It's the big change that we're making on the planet. And so my goal in that bigger sense is that I want to help that be as smooth as possible because change can be really difficult and challenging and painful, um, or a change can be beautiful and exciting and full of joy. And so that's really why I'm here at this time frame on the planet is to help that transition go more smoothly. It's going to happen one way or the other. You know, we're going to, there's no fighting the universe. We're all shifting into this new space, this new energy, but, uh, if we resist and hang on, it's it's you know it's kind of a difficult transition. So that's uh, that's that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm working on in the in the kind of bigger picture. Yeah. And I wanted to to go somewhere else, but now that you just brought that up, what what is the the new era kind of look like that you're talking about? And and what do you think the timeline is to? Is this a is this an unending transition? Is this like a circular? thing that happens where it won't there won't be like a we made it or is there a we made it and what does that look like well that's a good question actually so that i think that's uh yeah there won't necessarily be a time where we can say oh this is the date that you know we completely moved into this new energy um because we're, we're in it already what we're doing right now is we're trying to get us people to uh, switch over to the new paradigm that's already existing on the planet and um yeah, how to describe it? The um, probably the 
the thing that comes to mind, and there's so many answers, but the one that comes to mind is that we're, we're really moving out of a place on the planet where there wasn't enough access to resources for everybody. So the, we have, over the last you know, thousands of years, lived in a time where there really was some scarcity. So there just wasn't, if you took the total amount of stuff being produced on the planet that was available to humans and divvied it up equally, there still wasn't quite enough for everybody to be super comfortable and happy and, and um, live in the lifestyle that we have now. And so that, that created a mindset where people were competing, right? Because when there's not enough, you've got to compete. But we don't live in that time anymore. It's been uh, decades, actually, since we've moved economically out of that on the planet to where there's enough for everybody. There's Everybody could live at a very comfortable, very uh, luxurious even lifestyle. Every single person on the planet, there's enough. So we don't have to fight over slices of the pie anymore. Um, <laughs> but we do have a distribution problem now because we've we've all, you know, we're still in this scarcity mindset. Like even, even with things that aren't tangible, like love, we have scarcity around love. Oh, I have to cling to it. I have to hold on to it. If I find it, you know, I have to kind of, you know, don't let it go. But um, mm. in the place we're moving into is is out of that phase that we were in where things felt very scarce because it's not actually a natural phase. It's just kind of the the times that we were in. It's much more natural for things to be very abundant. This planet is beautiful. There's so much uh, available for everybody, even at the current, uh, you know, high population level. It's no problem. So that's kind of a, that's one answer that comes to mind, you know, but there's, there's so many. Yeah. Mm. I once, I, I once read an article about Tokyo and before I had ever traveled outside of the States, I was like, wow, like overpopulation is such a thing. And then I went to the first uh, Singularity University Global Summit. And there was a, a man who spoke. And then afterwards, I spoke to some of the attendees. And they talked about how uh, this guy, Peter Diamandis, had written about an underpopulation problem, specifically in first world countries. And I was like, huh, that's weird. And then I saw this article that said, if we, if the entire human race were to optimize efficiency the same way that Tokyo has, we could fit up to like 11 trillion humans on Earth. But because everyone's so inefficient, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just really getting efficiencies. But then, you know, like I've been traveling the whole United States this year since COVID, and there is a lot of empty space, you know, that, like definitely there's so much emptiness out there, which is just beautiful, just nature, nature, nature for, for hundreds and thousands of miles, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think, so, I think we're okay. I think... um yeah, we, we do have that problem to solve, like you mentioned, where we're inefficiently consuming what's available. Um, and part of that's the scarcity mindset that we've been moving out of. But it, it's that's not sustainable. We, we have to change that. Um, it's it, We don't have a choice. It's like, uh, you know, if you run out of gas in your car, you just run out. I mean, there isn't like, it's not a choice that you make. <laughs> it's a, it's like a fact, right? <laughs> so we were running out of stuff at this rate. Um but the Tokyo is an interesting example. Like you mentioned, it, it's, um, it is super crowded here. Like there's so many people, but you don't feel it. I, I, don't, I don't mean on a physical level. I mean on, a, on an energy level. Like the, the striking thing to me when I, when I moved here, uh, I was moving here from Sedona, Arizona, which is like living in a <laughs> national park. You know, it's just beautiful. There's not many people. There's so much nature. And I, I came here and I was walking around the city. It was... I kind of had a little jet lag, so it was about 12.30 at night and I'm walking through downtown. And I kept thinking, something's weird. There's something missing. I, I don't know what it is, but something feels weird. And it finally occurred to me, oh, it's danger. Danger is missing. I've never been in a big city by myself late at night wandering around and not felt some sense of, you know, that maybe it was a bad idea that I was in some danger. And I didn't find that in Tokyo. It, it was That was... It was so different that it was. It struck me <laughs> as something missing, and so I looked up the crime rates, and it turns out, even though this is the biggest city on the planet, uh, the biggest metropolis area on the planet, it has the same crime rate per capita as Sedona, which is about <laughs> which is about forty percent of the crime rate of the U.S. per capita. And so it's like, how did something? How do they do that? So many people with very little crime, and uh, a lot of it has to do with that. 
a lot of people in Japan have already made this transition out of me, 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 and into a space of we. So, yeah, very different. So many questions about that, but I wanna I wanna steer us and ask you a question I've I've wanted to ask for for a long time, and I've just never gotten around to it. So. I know in your history, uh, pre-spirit mind, which I'm I'm really excited to dig into for people, but pre-spirit mind, I I remember you mentioning in a story that you used to teach some really like wacky techniques, uh, stuff like trans or like like moving your consciousness to other places and like uh, I remember. Okay, I'll tell you a quick story too that I think would make it concrete for people. I got back from Jamaica from filming A-Fest at one point, and I had broken my foot in three places. And you and I were on the phone planning to, I think, film in Tokyo or something. And you were like, hey, Skip, I heard you broke your foot. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And we were on a Zoom call just like this or Skype. And you were like, do you mind if I take a look at it? And I was like, you're in Tokyo. I'm in L.A. What do you mean? Do you mind if you take a look at it? And I was like, go for it. And you just, you just sat there just like this and you just like close your eyes for a second and you're like, oh, hmm, that's really nice. And then you asked me and I had three days prior to this made a custom like meditation track for myself using this microphone, uh, visualizing a golden thread wrapping around my bones and like stitching it together. And I, I just came up with it on the spot and just like set it so that I could listen to it every day and help heal this like really painful wound, right? And you like closed your eyes for 10 seconds and then asked me, was I doing some sort of visualization with a golden thread? And I was just like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like I just made that up a few days ago. It wasn't like something that was ever taught. And right then, it was before we had done any of the spirit mind filming, I was like, okay, there are a lot of things I don't know about. <laughs> so kind of maybe tell a story or, or catch me up on like, what did you used to teach? And then kind of maybe bring that into what do you teach now and why? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll try to give you the, you know, the, the big story, but in a short time frame. So, yeah. So for me... My journey really began uh, when I was in college. So I've got a, a degree in mathematics and a degree in computer science. And so my my mindset is very scientific. So I, I like to know if things work. I like to try them out and experiment and find out for myself. <clears throat> and um, my experiences are really important for me. If somebody else tells me something's possible, um, I believe that it's possible, but I don't necessarily believe that it's true unless I've experienced it firsthand and have some something tangible to back it up with. And uh, so that's where I started. But in college, my girlfriend started giving me, you know, by hanging out with her, I started having some weird experiences that people would call intuition or psychic or, you know, healing experiences. I didn't know if any of this stuff was even possible, but I thought, this is fascinating. Either I'm going crazy or um, all the things that I believed were true are not, it's not that they weren't necessarily true, but there was a whole bunch of other stuff that was also true that I didn't know about. So this got me really excited. So then I, I spent the next 10 years uh, really studying. And, you know, first it was, this was pre-internet, you know, so I was first I was reading all the books and then I'd go to some workshops and I'd, I tried pretty much everything, you know, from, uh, you know, intuition, channeling, um, all the things you can imagine. And eventually I found schools that teach these things. And that's when stuff really started picking up. Like I mentioned earlier, I went to, uh, you know, my original uh, intuition and clairvoyant training was in Boulder, Colorado at Psychic Horizon Center. And things completely changed at that point because I realized, wow, um, you can tune in remotely. Like you mentioned, Skip, it's, it's very easy to see uh, people far away, to see things that are in different time frames in the, in the past or future probabilities. The, the limitations that we have in our physical senses um, only exist if we're dealing uh, in the physical. But we can use all of those senses and sort of de decouple them from that time-space uh, kind of lock that we have in our body and use them to, to spread out. It's, it's really fascinating. And for me, it was just a hobby. I just wanted to know if this stuff was true. And again, like I said, if I, if I can try it and have some experiences, 
That's compelling to me. Somebody tells me about something, mm, it's interesting, it's a fun story, but I've got to do it myself. And uh, eventually, so I kind of had this double life going where I'm, you know, by day I'm an engineer, and by night I'm going and taking these uh, energy healing classes and doing, giving intuitive readings for people and just, you know, playing on this level. And then I, I started to mix those together and doing those at work. And then eventually I just said, hey, this is really my calling. I'm just going to move out. I'm going to see if I can move on from my career. I had a 15 year career as a software engineer. I'm going to see if I can move on and, and do this intuition stuff full time, this healing stuff full time. And uh, that was that was 15 years ago now. <laughs> and, wow, wow. and things got and wait, you had a daughter at this point as as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, my daughter's. And she how just, old was she? Uh, she was. Uh, I was sort of in the middle of my clairvoyant training when she was born. Wow, that for me, because of the kids, like that just adds such a level of respect and understanding of like choosing to leave your career while she's around. You know, that's like a whole nother, a whole nother thing. Yeah. Well, it's funny. So. You know, a lot of people are in that same situation where they're they're in a, a job that they're not enjoying, even if they're good at it, and they want to do something different. And it was the same for me. And as scary as it is to make that choice, it's a little bit scarier for me to stay in the old situation. And so what actually happened was, um, you know, I'd worked at a bunch of little startups. I worked for the government, but eventually a startup I was in got purchased by Sun Microsystems. And I hung out there because it was really good and, you know, there was nice benefits and so on. And then eventually I got this 10-year gift that said, oh, including your time at the startup, you've been with us 10 years. And that's when I realized I needed to make a change. <laughs> because it's like, 10 years, wow. If I don't change course, I'll be getting that 20-year gift before I know it. And it's like, that's not really acceptable because I don't feel like I'm contributing the way I want to. I'm, I'm getting paid. I'm successful. Like I was really good at what I did. But as like, there's something in me that I want to give to the world. I don't even know 100% what it is yet, but there's something more that I want to give. And so I decided to lean into that. So for me, it was it was fear of the same, not fear of the, mm. the new. Uh, the, the fear of the new was there too, but the fear of the same was bigger. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway, so I'll, I'll give you the rest of the story real quick. So yeah, um, after that, I, I started doing uh, healing work and intuitive readings full time. And at 10 years, I had a private practice doing it. I was also teaching energy work and healing work. And that really changed my life because, you know, thousands of people that I worked with. And just like you said, just if you tune into somebody's energy and then you're brave enough to ask him, like, have you been doing something where you're, you know, using some golden threads, something like that? If you're brave enough to just say what you're seeing energetically, you get the validation on whether or not you're making it up. And so just time and time and time again, I realized, you know, I'm not making this up. There's no way I could be um, across all these test subjects getting the same results. So something's really happening. <laughs> And then teaching also brings that to a new level because when you teach something, you have to uh, break it down a little bit more. So it kind of comes out of that intuition and automatic space and goes more into like, you know, can I systemize this, systemize this in a way that people can uh, study and learn and everybody can kind of get through and get similar results. So it's really fun. For me, that's the, you know, I used to program computers and now I kind of program intuition and consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, really fun. And then in the last few years, you started leaning into, are you openly talking about spirit mind yet? A little bit. Yeah. Cause we're getting closer, you know, closer to delivery. So, mm -hmm. so when this whole idea came around, maybe catch people up on the story of like, how did this become, uh, such a big project for you? Yeah, you bet. Yeah. So, um, what happened with spirit mind was, uh, Ten years ago, I, I met my wife, Hisami, and uh, just a little backstory on us. When I, I met Hisami here in Tokyo, I was here on a, in a teaching invitation, and she wasn't a student. She was just a friend of a friend that I met. And 
when I met her, I was, I was totally blown away. I just, I knew that she was amazing. I knew I wanted to be with her. And, but we didn't, we didn't speak the same language. I didn't speak any Japanese. She didn't speak any English, but it didn't matter. We, we, you know, we had enough love. We had enough, uh, we both could see energy and work with energy. And that was enough for us to get married. And, you know, 10 years later, we're still happy. Uh, but the, the thing that changed for me so much with Hisami is that the systems that I mentioned, where I had a systematic approach that I had learned and that I was teaching for how to get people to open up their intuition, for how to do energy healing, for um, what some people would call like spiritual studies. And they work. I know the system works, but my wife, Hisame, uses none of them. So she doesn't use any of the tools and techniques. She didn't study from any teachers, yet she has more peace of mind than anybody I've met. She's able to uh, act gracefully more easily than anybody I've met. She she really lives in a way that, you know, is a kind of the highest form of what I, I'd hoped I could attain by following all these systems and rules, but she doesn't follow any <laughs> or any that anybody else has. And, and she doesn't have a lot of the problems that came with um, kind of the way I was doing things. Uh, she doesn't struggle with... Um, with the ego as much. She doesn't struggle with, uh, you know, overthinking, just a lot of things that kind of plague me as a, as a, as a mind person you knows that scientific mind is kind of crazy. She doesn't have any of those. And so I finally got brave. This was, um, four years ago now. And I, I got an interpreter to come with me to one of Hisami's classes. Cause she'd been teaching her work, her spirit mind work for a long time. And uh, that kind of began the journey of realizing, wow, I want to lean into this because uh, this is a next step for me. The highest I can go with the stuff I'm learning is still below kind of where she can take me with her teaching. She doesn't even call it teaching. She just says, oh, I'm just sharing stuff with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's the journey I've been on for the last four years. And it's been fascinating. And uh, I, I can't wait to release the product. You know, we'll, it'll, you know, we're probably, we're still a few months out, but we are getting close finally. And, uh, it, but it's, it's mind blowing. It's totally mind blowing, both in its simplicity and how effective it's, how effective it is. Have you taken any like beta students through? Uh, a little bit, just in live classes. So we've taken people through, we've done, we did a live training in Tokyo and then we did one in, in Hungary and Budapest, and we did one in San Diego in the U.S. And uh, and then it was really clear, okay, we got to, you know, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> I'm totally in, yeah, let's yeah. make this. Uh, but uh, but we haven't taken anybody through uh, other than the live trainings. Yeah. Got it. So then uh, let me bring you back. You mentioned, and I'm, I'm curious if it goes even further back than this. Um, okay, let me ask you the first question. So what is the earliest experience you can remember in hindsight that you think about where you were like, that was maybe an indication of who you were going to become and like how you were going to, because you said there was something in you that wanted to serve in like a different way than what you were doing engineering. What's the earliest experience you can remember of now looking back being like, if I had known that was an indicator? Yeah, the, I'll just tell you what's coming to mind. It's kind of a weird example, but uh, when I was in junior high, uh, I was with a friend of mine, and we were we were up at the high school watching a basketball game, and we're sitting in the bleachers in the back, and I have no idea why, but I just mentioned to my friend, oh, by the way, I can influence whether or not people score or not, and like I said, I have no idea why I said this, and he said, well, that's that's crazy, you can't do that. And I said, okay, well, let's just let's just go for it. So. I started, uh, I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop. Uh, we're going to get the, when people go to score, we're going to block the the ball so they can't make it. They can't score. And so the, and they, they were tied at the time and they were playing the score. You know, it, both teams were pretty good. So it was going up, going up, going up. And then it just stopped. And uh, so they tied. We went into overtime. My friend's looking at me. He doesn't believe me. We go into the second overtime. We go into the third overtime. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, and then I said, "Okay, enough. All right, let's let him score." 
and then I change the energy, boom, next basket goes in. And I was just playing. I had I didn't have any intention. It just occurred to me that that was possible. And I don't even know what I did. You know, looking back, like I said, I was in junior high. <laughs> I was pretty young. I was maybe 13 or 14. Wow. Um, but that's the earliest one that comes to mind where it's like something really just totally outside the norm happened where I had this confidence and this knowingness about something that nobody had taught me. And then we tested it and it worked in, in that situation. Yeah. Wow. After that, did you, did you play with anything like that? After that experience? Did, were you like, no, what else? I, it was just a one-time drop in. Oddly I didn't. Yeah. That was just something that happened. And I, I didn't, it didn't strike me as unusual. It struck, my friend was really shocked. He couldn't believe it. But for me, it didn't seem weird to me. It was just, mm. I just knew this was possible and I did it, but I didn't see any particular need to keep doing it. Like it wasn't, um, oddly, I'm not, I'm not that driven to manipulate things. Um, but I guess that's, that's good. I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the difference between Sauron and Gandalf, right? <laughs> right, like... right. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a daughter. And so my question is, in regards to, let's say, like babies, small children, I can imagine you have a whole wealth of knowledge and insight into... I have so many questions about this, but um, is there anything like really important that you think uh, could be shared that would really uh, help people understand like the role of children, uh, maybe in your life or in our lives? And hmm. I, I have so many questions to go from there, but I feel like there's maybe something really important that you could share and then I can ask more specifics. Sure. Yeah. The things that come to mind is... Um... You know, for me, when my daughter Mariah was born, it, it just opened up something in me that opened me up to a love I didn't even know was there before. And it's just automatic. You know, I was I was there. I, I caught her when she was was born, and um, it's just unbelievable. You know, just that first look into her eyes, and um, I don't think there's any other way to get that other than having kids. Like for me, it was a unique experience that opened something up that you know, never completely closed after that. It's like I knew that that potential existed. But um, an important thing, I guess, you know, the thing that comes to mind, it's probably important to, to listen and to learn not the information that your kids have necessarily, because, you know, as an adult, you probably have learned more information, but to listen and learn to their method of approaching the world is children are still in a very natural state. You know, it takes quite a number of years for us to kind of program into, you know, program our kids into our culture and our society and so on. And so you can learn early on, like, what's it like to be free? If you pay attention to your kids, you know, what, how are they different? What are the things that you want to control in them? And what if you didn't need to, or didn't want to, or, just question the, you know, why why is it important that things be my way or be society's way? You know, that thing I think is an opportunity to really open up and be a lot more free, and uh, and a lot happier. Hmm. And then let me back up another thing. To you said uh, for intuition, there were two things. There was grounding in the physical body, and then there was the quieting of the mind, or rather, uh, like allowing maybe the feelings to go through rather than the thoughts to control our decisions, right? So from a perspective of the body, are there guidelines that you give there on how we can we can get grounded in our body? You said like nature was one way. Um, I believe you listed some other things. What are kind of your favorite things or, or things that you sure. teach people about that? Yeah, the... Um... The easiest thing, I mean, if anybody who's watching, you can try it right now. The easiest way is to just visualize that your hips, so your root chakra, you can just imagine your hips, base of your spine, there's the energy extending down right now, right from 
that root chakra and down into the center of the earth. So you can feel it like a tree trunk extending down. You can feel like a, a waterfall if that visualization is better or a beam of light. And as you do that, just notice right now what feels different. Because it's, it's rare for us to really put our attention on being grounded and present in the body. But when we do, we all recognize that feeling. Like even as I'm doing it now, I'm like, oh, I'm suddenly I'm right here looking at you from behind my eyes instead of floating around with all my thoughts. <laughs> you know, I just got really focused and centered and present. I can also feel more, I feel a little bit like um, kind of heavier and more tangible. Not so much mind. I feel like I'm more, you know, heart. I come into the mm -hmm. body. So it's it's very easy. If um, you can also just uh, touch something in nature. You know, when I get off the the plane when I'm traveling, it's very common for me to go outside. You know, put my feet in the grass. You know, lean up against a tree, hug a tree, and that you know that that connection with the planet it just it resets the body and says, oh, now I'm here. Oh, now I'm in I'm in Los Angeles. You know, I, I was on this plane and I was over in Tokyo, but now I'm in Los Angeles. And so that reality check allows your whole body to update and be like, oh, boom, I'm in present time now. It's also a great cure for jet lag. If you do that, you'll notice your jet lag is uh, significantly less. Yeah. Hmm. So then I'm curious, was there ever a time throughout this big journey with all these abilities and these classes and teachers and, and just teaching as well yourself that you got like really deep into this stuff or maybe like too deep at some point and you had to like recenter yourself? Oh yeah, many, many times, yeah, so. You almost like burst into butterflies I've, at some point. I've gone off the deep end, you know, many times and it's okay. So the, the journey there is a, a hardest thing for us to grow beyond is our own beliefs. So we all have our own idea of how things are, how they should be. And those are pretty rigid, even though, uh, even though they do change over time. Um, and it's really hard to get past those. So what usually happens when we do is we go sort of way past them. So I've seen this in my students so many times. I have pe a lot of people come to me and say, hey, you know, I thought all this energy stuff was nonsense. I don't believe in intuition or energy work or healing. But then I, for some reason, when you said it, it seemed like it might be real. So I took your class and I started feeling energy between my hands. I started grounding myself. I started noticing changes in my life. And, and so that, that opened up their belief system, right? So, but then the next thing that happens, which is actually kind of funny, and it's funny because I did it too, is suddenly everything is believable. Not just the, not just the tangible things that I had an experience with that opened my mind, but suddenly I start believing everything, right? Oh, there's like, my friends were being visited by aliens and this is happening and like, you know, and all these stories. And, and suddenly there's, because we were awakened to a bigger potential, uh, we sort of enter that like a child, very naive and very um, excited about the possibilities. But we don't have a very strong sense of discernment yet because it's new territory. And... You know, I went through that and I find it really fun, actually. It's just part of the fun part of the journey because even the most serious, practical, um, skeptical person will get into this space of sort of this childlike naiveness. And it's, it's beautiful. It's really fun. And then, of course, with experience, uh, that starts to come back down and you realize, you know, for me personally, I realize, oh, okay, so I got a little carried away. I, you know, kind of went off the deep end, but now I'm now my experiences, my information is catching up with, you know, that beautiful vision that I had. But, you know, that happens over and over and over. That's just kind of the process of growth. So, mm, Interesting. And then there is this beautiful model you've described several times that I think would be awesome to hear again, which is there's the, I, I forget the terminology you use, but it's like the type of, type one, two, three, four, or something like this, A, B, C, D, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can talk can about that a little bit. describe that model? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so this is, part of, this is part of the spirit mind training that we're making right now. And, and so I should preface it. So the spirit mind training, it, it's, it really is my story, but it's not my teaching, right? So it's, it's 
my story of learning from my wife, Yusami, all the information that she has and trying it on and seeing and trying to get it to jive with the things that I believed and knew to be true. So it, so it really is my story, but it's, uh, it's not my journey. And a big part of that story, which is what um, Hisami had told me originally, she said, okay, there's these different phases of spiritual growth that we go through. And where we start out is where everything is very tangible and physical. And we, you know, the important thing is to take care of ourselves. And that's where, that's kind of what we call the old energy, where people have been hanging out for a long time. And then um, something changes and we get this, we start noticing like, oh, I have this desire for change. So, and we, we move into this second phase where we're very uncomfortable. The things that we want and the things that we have don't match. And I don't mean the physical things we want and have don't match. That was all that first phase. But the second phase is more like what I went through in my software career where, you know, I, I can check all the boxes. I have the house, the car, the, the job, the money, check, 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 all these things, but I'm not happy. I, I have all the things that I thought I needed to make me happy, but I'm not. So, so that's that second phase. And it's, it's very confusing because we did what we thought we were supposed to do, <laughs> but we didn't get the, the internal results. We just got the external results. And then the third phase is kind of what I just mentioned, this one where we, we can, you know, we start to catch up, we start taking action on these new desires, but we don't really have the understanding yet. And so we look, we can look kind of childlike and exaggerated. And, and, um, and for me, that's, that went on for a long time. So I, you know, I studied the furthest out things I could find. I, I studied how to get out of the body, how to travel out of body, how to, how to uh, leave and to bring other beings in and, and have them talk through me. I, I taught channeling classes for many years in Tokyo. Um, I've, you know, I, I went about as far out as I can imagine. If there was something further. It's, it's only because I didn't hear about it. It's the only reason I didn't try it. What, what was the <laughs> farthest out thing that you did? Um, probably the, I would say the channeling is probably the furthest out. Um, you know, traveling out of the body and then um, uh, there's something, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody do it, to be honest. But the, the valuable piece about that is if you get, and this is, this is why I taught it for some time, is that if you can give people an experience where they, they are outside their physical body, but still aware. So there's that, that's the first case. Like I must be something else, not the physical body. Cause I'm tangibly not in it right now, but I still exist. Okay. So there's your first clue. And then uh, the next step, if you can get uh, we're, we're having a little typhoon here. So <laughs> if you hear some rain, that's what's happening. <laughs> the second step is if, if you can get another spirit to come into that person's body that they're not in, and talk, that completely blows you away. Because then you're like, I'm not doing that. I'm not saying anything, but my body's talking. And I'm watching, which is really weird, because that must mean I'm not in it. So these, uh, these are pretty far out experiences. But when you have that, you have firsthand information. You have, you have an experience that I am not just my body. It's just, there's just no way around it, because I just had that experience especially if you can replicate that and have it multiple times, see many people go through it. Um, really fascinating. But I don't teach it anymore because it's not important. Like what's important is for you to be in your body, not to be out of your body. <laughs> and what's important is if you have other things coming in and speaking through, you want to get a hold of that and get rid of that and clean it up. You want to be you. There's no uh, person or spirit or anything outside of you that has more important information for you. Like you, you have it all. It's all inside you. It's uh, I, I learned, I knew this on an intellectual level, but I didn't really get it tangibly until I started studying with my wife. And that's when I really got like, wow, there's, you know, that journey within is so much more uh, important. Mm. And I feel like I'll share the story of Mind Valley Live earlier this year. For people uh, who know me but don't know you yet to give even more concreteness here, I was in New York City and I had an electrician come over because we had an outlet that was broken. And I it was 11 p.m. at night on a Sunday and the kids had school the next morning. So I was really trying to like rush him. And I was like, you know, if we can't like fix it, it's totally okay. It's one outlet. 
don't worry about it. Like, I'd rather get the kids to bed, you know, because they're going crazy. And he was like, no, 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 no. You know, I was like, uh, okay, okay. So I'm helping him trying to get this stuff done. And we're testing all these different things that aren't working. And I'm holding, at one point, I'm holding the outlet. And he flicks a switch that works. And I've got my whole hand wrapped around the outlet, right? And I get such an intense electrical burst through my hand that I can't say anything. I can't move. I can't let the outlet go. The electricity is fully on and I'm gripping all the way around it. And I'm like, and it takes me, I'm not sure how, how long, one, two, three, four long seconds to like wiggle it out of my hand so that I'm not being electrocuted anymore. And then my heart rate elevated dramatically, right? I started sweating immediately. My, my face went super red and I barely slept that night because my whole system was just wired, right? And I pretended like everything was okay. And I was like, okay, let me get the kids to bed. And he left and everything and it was all working. And it was two or three weeks later. It was about a week long process of, I was like really sluggish in the mornings, which I'm a morning person. Like I love the sunrise. Like I love getting up. I have tons of energy in the morning and at night I fall asleep very quickly and I was nothing but the opposite. And over the course of a week, it got more and more unlike me. And then it really was a strange experience where I went to lunch with Tulin and we were sitting there, and I, and I love talking to her, and she's got a fascinating mind, and she's saying something super interesting. Like, I recognized that what she was saying was interesting, but what came out of my mouth was, I really don't want to talk right now. And I, I just said that. I looked at her, and it was straight in the eyes, cold face, and you know me, like, that's not like me at all, where I was like, I really don't want to talk right now. And then I just looked away. And it was, at that point, I recognized that, like, I didn't say that. But I, but I said that. And so I had not had any sort of experience like you were describing to understand what was going on. I just felt bad. I just felt like, oh my God, like, I, why would I say that? I want to like unsay that. So I like turned and I was like, I'm so sorry that I said that. I don't know why I said that. And then I just went back, but I still felt angry. Like there was anger in me, but I don't know. It was a very weird experience. So then later that day, I was like coming to the party at the Mind Valley event and I came up to you and I, and I told you what had happened. And I don't even remember like the specifics of what I had told you, but Tulin was like really worried because she's like, you're just being weird and maybe like we got to do something about this. And I was like, I agree. Like, I don't know what's wrong with me. Something's really weird. And I told you the electrocution story and I didn't connect the dots on these two things. And you were like, oh yeah, you didn't explain anything. You were just like, oh, yeah, just like, you mind if I take a look, right? Same thing with the golden thread. And you put like your hand back here and I broke out into an insane sweat almost instantaneously and a crowd started to form and I literally have sweat like beating down my head all of a sudden and it felt like I like halved my weight. It was almost like uh, like clothes, like if I was wearing a full jumpsuit, it just got stripped off of me and thrown onto the ground and I like just started sweating, right? And then suddenly I started smiling. And it was like, and that's like my normal base mode. It's just like I'm almost constantly smiling while awake, right? So I went out to the party and suddenly I felt completely normal again. And I felt like grounded and present. And I'm still not even sure what had happened there. But when you tell this story about channeling, it, it kind of brings me into this idea of like, you know, clearly people... It got me really worried for other people and also excited to be able to share the story that if you ever have an experience like that, maybe it's like it's not all you. And that's where sometimes you might be thrust into learning about this and you need to to figure out. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah. Well, there's just yeah, there's so much there. I mean, so. Yeah, I don't I don't talk about mediumship much anymore and channeling just because, like I said, it's not I don't think people need to try to do it. Uh, but there are a lot of situations where we could try to stop doing it that would be helpful. And uh, I remember with you, it was just really clear. And I could see that your, you know, the space back here in the back of your head, that's where if, if I was going to sit you down and take your spirit out and plug some other spirit in, because that's, I used to do those things <laughs> in my crazy days. Um, that's where I would do it. Right. And I could see, oh, you just, you're not in your body. And you've got some interference, 
both uh, electrical from the physical thing you had and a, and some from a you know different uh, spirit or different life. Uh, and so I just took it out uh, because it, and it's it's not that hard to do it. It's the reason I make it sound really kind of easy is because it is. So your spirit and your energy has priority in your body. This is your body. So there's there's nothing else that can come in if you know that and if you claim that space is yours. So the example I'd like to use, it's like, you know, I've got a glass here. If, um, if I've got this glass of water and, you know, the water is my energy and the glass is my body, if there was a little oil in there that was not my energy, uh, people might think, oh, I need to get the oil out, so I'm going to get a spoon or I'm going to get a you know, a sponge or maybe a, a laser, you know, or something, I'm going to somehow get that out of there. But if you just poured more water in, the glass would fill up and then that would just float off the top automatically. So the only reason there's anything other than you in your body is because you're not full. So there's room. Um, so it's not a, it's not a hard thing. So you don't have to struggle or try to kick anything out. You just have to get you in and, and fill up with yourself. And there won't be room for anything else because you have priority. You always have priority in your body. How do um, we do that? How do we fill up? Well, there's uh, getting grounded. Is you know, grounded is one of the big ways, and also turning down the the analyzer. When we're when we're analyzing things, we're not really very present in our body. We're we have our awareness spread all over the place, and um, not just real places, but places we've made up. You know, like systems of thinking and models, and <laughs> you know, things that are just abstract. We're not in the physical. Uh, so to really fill yourself up, uh, yeah, do things in nature, exercise, touch, you know, these, these things are, are fantastic for that. But and yours was a little bit of a special case because you had a little damage there. You had a little electrical damage to your system. Um, so we just did a little, you know, a little quick touch up, fixed it. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was absolutely insane. I was a different person. Yeah. But it's, it uh, it's fun because... Um, I said I don't I don't talk about these things much. One because it's not it's not super important, but um, also because it's very hard to believe. If you haven't had an experience with it, it just sounds crazy. And uh, you know, so those are my those are the two reasons I don't talk much about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's exactly the reason I wanted to share it. Is anyone watching who's who watches my stuff? Uh, it happened. It happened. And. <laughs> and then I, I, you know, Tulin was the one who, who told me to maybe talk to you about it. And I, and she doesn't even know you and I have known you. And I was like, I don't really know if this is something that that's like solvable. I think I just need to like, I don't know, breathe and take some breaks. And then, yeah. And then you did that. And I was like, Oh, got it. Well, this when I a, was, yeah. when I was in private practice, just to, not as, you know, I'm not a doctor. When I was in private practice as a, as a counselor and intuitive counselor and as a healer, um, that was the, a very common story. People would come to me and say, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why you, I came to you in particular. I'm not even really interested in this whole genre of stuff that you're doing, but I knew I needed to be here. And so here I am, right? And this happened to all the time in Sedona, I'd people come from other countries and say the same thing. And the answer was almost always the same. It was like, well, you're, you're here because I can, I can help. And it usually had something to do with a little disturbance they had with their mediumship. So just sorting things out to get them more present and to clear up any interference that was there. And, you know, most of the time uh, we can just do it in one session and people are on their way and they just get a little thank you later says, I don't know what you did. I don't need to know, but I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, kind of fun. Wow. So what does your own work look like these days? Like, what do you do for yourself? And, and what are you improving? Or, or what are the things that, that you work on? Yeah, well, for me, what I'm working on right now is, is really getting uh, into the spirit mind training and into the spirit mind work with my wife. And so what that means for me personally is, is going deeper into turning down the mind and deeper into uh, letting go of the ego. And 
uh, ego is not a bad thing. It's it's uh, it's really helpful for building a business. It's helpful for self confidence, all these things. But it's it's not a good driver. It's a good worker, right? But you you know your best workers don't make the best CEOs, right? And the CEOs aren't necessarily the best workers, <laughs> right? You kind of need one of each, and um, so taking the ego and letting it be that worker, but not thinking it's in control and letting my spirit mind be uh, that part that's, uh, you know, guiding and sort of setting the stage. And so what that looks like for me is, you know, I took a, a little bit of break from the normal energy work that I do and just said, okay, if I set those aside, can I get the same results doing this other techniques? And the answer is, uh, yeah, I can get very similar results and um, you know, really fun. And the deepest thing I would say and that's happened in that journey is that the part of me that likes to assist, make a system out of things and to teach things and that engineering mind has uh, become less, not less interesting, but something that I, it's less of a habit now than it was before. And so my habit is switching to be much more in the moment and natural and flowing. And I like it. It feels really good. My, you know, my stress level is coming down a lot uh, just from making these transitions. Yeah. Hmm. And where did the stress come from before? Like, what were the things in your life that were stressful? Yeah, the stress, uh, what I've realized, actually, even this week, I noticed, is like, oh, my, my life inherently has very little drama in it. But my mind has inserted a whole lot of drama all over the place into my work, into my relationships, into my health. Now, pretty much everything has some layer of story that I've created and it tried to enforce or resist or, you know, that, and that's, that has caused a lot of friction and a lot of stress and a lot of drama. But it's not real any more than... Um, any other thought would be. So it's, yeah. So the, the stress, I mean, where it came from, it, it comes from inside. <laughs> so an example, um, but like, like I could use an example of, um, uh, with work. So if something's happening at work, like, so say I've got a, a new release going with Mind Valley, where we're re-releasing one of my products and there's, you know, it's some changes happening. Um, those are all good things. You know, the, what the reality of the situation is a bunch of people that I trust and that I like working with are collaborating with me to help more people in a way that I enjoy helping people. Like, it's all, it's all good. <laughs> but my mind starts to put extra stuff in. Like, oh, there needs, this part needs to happen faster or it needs to happen in just the way that I want or uh, we forgot this thing. Or sometimes the story is, oh, maybe they're not enjoying working with me right now because... I'm too demanding or, you know, just all the stories that, that we can make up, I make them up too. I'm no different than anybody else that way. <laughs> so, uh, mm -hmm. and, and then starting to make choices as if those things were true. So I might send an email and the premise, the unwritten premise of that email is that they're feeling a certain way or that we're failing in a certain way or succeeding in a certain way. And those things aren't necessarily true, but I'm communicating from that space. So people kind of have no choice but to sort of re respond in that way. And then a dialogue starts happening that later I realize oh, that's completely unnecessary. That's just a whole thread that I started from a little fear or insecurity that I had. And uh, so what's happening now is I see those things as they're happening and I, I stop. I don't send the email and I just kind of, you know, let, let the stuff float by and see what's actually happening. And it's always something beautiful. So like I said, I'm noticing there really is inherently very little drama in, in my life, probably in most people's lives. I don't mean to make light of it. If you have, you know, real trauma or drama in your life, that's, that's real too. But there's probably a whole a mountain of extra stuff that you're adding on that's not necessary. Hmm. And then earlier you mentioned that with the things that you used to teach, you would look at like current, past, and uh, you said something about like potential futures, right? 
where you so basically what you're telling me is that at some point you did the time stone like Doctor Strange and like used to look into futures uh do you still do that now and do you have any funny stories about that yeah i i still do it a little bit but not as much as i as i used to so i used to be pretty obsessed with it because again i was just gathering information so i used to look at everything energetically and just test everything is is this you know should i go that way should i eat this thing um when i'm driving to work like which road should i take to get there the fastest i used to use my intuition for everything just because I was learning and it was fun. It's you know, it's a way of getting feedback. But um, oh, I kind of spaced out. So tell, ask me the question again there. <laughs> so yeah, you used to do all these like probable future things. And my question was, yeah, do you have any like funny stories or interesting stories or epic stories about doing that? Uh, epic stories. So the... Um, And there's so many, I'm trying to pick a good one. So the here I'll, I'll, what I'll tell you is, a, it's a little bit different from your question, but here's what comes to mind. So what I've, what I learned from doing this, from being, is like, one, it is possible to stretch your awareness and lean into the future. And you can pick up on the different possibilities that are out there and kind of the likelihood that each one is gonna happen. So you kind of get that probability space it's, it's not that hard to do. But the, the thing that comes to mind that I think people might enjoy is that uh, the way to do it is much different than I originally thought. So what you need to do if you want to be able to sense what's happening in the future is you need to be very present in the now. Because what, what happens is we usually think of now as this very tiny sliver of time that the, you know, the future is on one side and the past is on the other and there's this little tiny point that's now. But the more, it's actually, an, uh, if you understand math, there's actually an asymptote in the now. So the closer you get to now, the higher you go up that scale. And, and it's, an, it's an infinite peak right there. And what that means as far as awareness is your now gets bigger. So your now moment can, it doesn't have to be a moment or a second. It can expand and be a minute. And it can expand to be uh, a few months, a few years. And that's when you're in that space, that's when you're accessing all that information. So you're not actually going anywhere or looking at something that's not happening now. Uh, you, your now has just become large enough to include those things that most people think are in the future. And do you think that we have encounters with that on a regular basis and maybe don't know that we're doing it? Sure. Or not consciously aware. Yeah, that's been my it's been my experience, but also with my with my students and clients over the years, almost everybody's had an experience where they um, they knew something happened to their brother or sister before they called, so they were able to pick that up somehow energetically. Or <clears throat> a really common one is people think, you know, they're going out the door, they see the umbrella there, and they think, should I take the umbrella? And again, they, they mistake their intuition for a question instead of an answer. And they say, no, I don't need it because it's not going to rain. <laughs> and they go out. <laughs> and uh, and then they later in the day, they realize it's pouring rain. Why didn't I take the umbrella? I knew I needed it. So it's, it's, it's actually quite normal to be in that space where you're accessing things in different time frames uh, and different, different you know, uh, physical spaces, something that happens far away. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so common. In fact, people don't even think it's weird. Like nobody in that situation would go, whoa, this morning I knew I needed the umbrella. Wow, what's going on? I need to take a class. You know, it's just, it's not weird at all. It's just like, ah, you know, why didn't I listen? Hmm. Uh, it's, it's very normal. And it's happening what, all the time. Yeah. What would you recommend for people who, well, I have two questions, actually. One is context-based. You went through this story, the story that you're going to talk about in that new product, Spirit Mind, right? But the teaching is Yasami's. Do you think that people have to go through some of that story to get to Spirit Mind, or can they just go straight to Spirit Mind? It's a journey. Yeah, it's a journey because you're... Um... Your, you know, your, your beliefs and your understanding about how things work and your desires and your actions, like these change at different paces. 
you know, when, when we're in one reality, the first thing that opens up is, <clears throat> is our desire for something different. Even though none of our actions have changed, none of our understanding has changed, we just have some desire. And so that's what pulls us into one phase. Uh, after we get over sort of the, the fear of taking action for that desire, that pulls us into the next phase. Uh, and then eventually, like I said, just recently for me in the last few years, there's an understanding that actually comes that it goes much deeper than any spiritual uh, training or, or reading that I've ever seen before. And so, yeah, there, I, I don't think it's possible to skip steps in that journey uh, because that it's just, uh, that's kind of the way we grow in general. Yeah. Although we'll see, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's uh, you know, I, I also think that the place we're moving to is more natural than the place we've been in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, if we could somehow let go, like I said, if you, when people come in as a child, they come in in this, for this state already. And we just sort of learn to move back into this uh, more materialistic state. Hmm. And how would you define ego? It's something you've talked about uh, a few times throughout all of this. Uh, how would I define ego? Yeah, so ego is, um, it's basically just our thinking mind. So it's, um, he saw me likes to say, it's like we have two minds. We have the spirit mind that we're used to using, and then we have the ego, which she calls a material mind. It's really good at the material world. And um, most of us think that we are this material mind or this ego. Like that's our identity. That's who we believe we are. When we say I, that's what we mean, is this, this thinking. You know, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> right? We, we believe that's true. But uh, even if you didn't think, you would still be. And so that's, uh, you know, that's this other mind. Mm. I don't know if that's a very good, good answer there, but. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, I love it. And it's so funny. I feel like every, every, almost every single answer and every question I've ever asked of you kind of always leads to like, I can't wait for spirit mind to come out. Like, I, I just can't wait for this thing to come out so that we can all just go to this and, and learn all of the stuff you guys have been working on for so long now. So. <clears throat> If someone wants to, let's say they're they're watching this or listening to this, and they're that same person, they don't, they're not even sure why, like this is the episode that they're in on, or they've been listening this long to it, and they know they want to start their story. Um, how? Where where would they go? What do you think? What would be a recommendation of of how to sure. begin? So. Uh... If somebody is feeling attracted to to my work or to the spirit mind and Isami's work, uh, the the two starting points we have right now are my other two programs with Mind Valley. So uh, one program is the duality program about energy work and energy training, and it's it's really it's good for people that are used to dealing with the material world, so that want you know you you want to um, achieve things, you want to create more, you want to do some healing. So you have some goals that you're trying to achieve. And so it's a, it's like a system for going through and, you know, how would you work on the energy to achieve these things? So it kind of augments the things you already know, but it's, it's very mind-based. So it's still really much, you know, I, I was a lot in my mind when I wrote that, uh, partially because I was writing to an audience that that's where they are. That's where most of us are. So that program is, is really good. That duality program um, but there's a lot of people, the reason I made a second program is that there's a lot of people that don't, aren't in that mental space, but want to grow through their experiences, right? And so I, I'm, I'm actually more like that, where I want to have just a whole bunch of experiences and then sort them out for myself, what the meaning is. I don't need somebody to tell me what it all means. But uh, in this program, I give, it's a 60-day program, it's called Unlocking Transcendence. And I just thought of what are all the crazy experiences that I've had in my life? And can I give all of them to people in a simple way without having to really teach anything, right? <laughs> and so this program, so but it's still organized. You go through and you learn about time and space. You know, it's kind of where you start. You learn about your physical body and your energy body and your emotions and spirituality and uh, empathy and collaboration. So there's you know, these different categories, but I don't teach anything. It's all experiences. So um, I guide people through the journey and we, we do a, 
every day there's just a little bit different journey where you experience something new and then it's kind of up to you to sort out what to do with all that information. But uh, so those two are really great, just depending on where somebody's coming from. Um, the Unlike and Transcendence just opens you up to like, whew, all this new information um, w without giving you answers necessarily. And uh, they're both they're both good. You know, like they both kind of line up in that journey that, you know, you know, my life story, you know, I kind of started here with the duality training and I moved more into the unlocking transcendence mode. And then now I'm over here in the spirit mind. It's a continuum. So um, both of those are great warm ups yeah. and, and not just no. warm ups. They're great programs all by themselves. <laughs> yeah. To get those experiences and go through that story. Yeah. I love that. So throughout this conversation, uh, I believe two or three times you've brought up for different categories that getting grounded, getting in the physical body, right? Getting in your body, filling up that vessel, so to speak. And number two, quieting the mind and the chatter are the two like key things to, to what seems like a lot of the stuff that you're talking about. And we've talked about how to ground. Do you have some guidelines on because I mean, I mean, we could talk for days about like different meditation techniques people talk about and learn and teach. But what are some of your top recommendations for quieting the mind? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny because the, the the question is like, make, make a list of things to stop making a list. <laughs> right? <laughs> totally true. Totally so, true. So yeah. I'm an endless list. Give me some advice on how to stop following everybody's advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, could you could you give me a method to to throw away all my methods? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the there's a lot of answers. So the probably some of the most practical one is is stop trying so hard. So we we all have this idea that uh, smarter is better, and you know we want to be the smartest person in the room, and we want to, you know, we want to hold, yeah, you know, have our own shows, right, and our own programs, and if people listen to us, we're important, and then we should listen to important people. And uh, these are just these are just ideas. These things aren't true. So you we can everybody's important inherently. You don't it doesn't matter if anybody's listening to you or not. <laughs> right, and, and you don't need to listen to anybody else to get your information. You have all your information already. Like no, nobody else has your information. I don't have your information. You have it. And so, uh, you know, changing and getting to turn down the mind, uh, it's kind of just getting that aha that like I don't need my mind all the time. It's like if if uh, you know, I'm driving my car in Tokyo. I recently bought a car after many years with, uh, you know, without, and, and there's sometimes like the navigation is like that mind, right? I can turn on this navigation system. It'll give me precise, you know, hopefully helpful instructions for how to get everywhere. But sometimes I, I can, I can drive without it. Like I don't need that on to drive to the gas station. I don't need it on, you know, to go <laughs> visit somebody I know, <laughs> um, but the habit is to turn it on all the time now. And it's just barking these instructions and then I'm following them. But he saw me, he's really laughed at me a few times where I'll make a turn and she'll say, why did you go this way? And I'll say, well, the uh, the navigation system told me and I, I know that it's connected to the, you know, the GPS and to the traffic monitoring and everything. So I assumed it knew what it was doing. And she's just laughing. She says, but if you like looked with your eyes, didn't you notice that there's something happening over here and that the place we're going is over there or that there was traffic here, but not here? Like, like your eyes had all this information <laughs> that's valid now, but I was like, you know, I'm looking to this outside source and it always makes me laugh too. And I kind of wake up and say, oh, it's true. I don't, I don't need all this external information and I don't really need to think that much. We just have this habit, you know, that we should use our mind all the time. And um, realizing that and getting out of the habit and also, you know, getting out of the uh, the idea that we should measure ourselves by how well we're doing in our mind, but letting those things go are are really important. They're really critical. I, I could give you different steps, you know, like here's a three things you could do or four things you could do, but I, I think it's more powerful to say, um, just stop following all the steps. Let yourself be open. You know, take a take a day off and don't do anything. You know, turn your phone off for an hour, and see what happens. 
what you know listen what what do you want to do today you know if it's if you don't want to go to work today and you don't have to go to work well then don't do something that you want <laughs> right it's a it's not that hard it's very it's very very simple but it's um it's challenging it's challenging to get a mindset change yeah hmm. and maybe similarly to how you describe getting into the body of going into nature, exercising, uh, eating food that you love, like these are ways to get very present physically. Um, you know, there's a variety of, of ways to like get out of the mind, right? And, and maybe grounding and those same exact things are the same ways to get out of the mind, right? When you're eating good food, you're probably not thinking about the 17 ingredients that went into the food. You're just enjoying the moment to the food, right? Oh, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> both, both can happen. Um, it's, you know, my mind is really active. So I've found that my mind can interrupt everything, even the most profound moments. My mind is happy to jump in and just add a, some narration and nonsense. <laughs> um, but I guess what, what changed is um, I've had a few experiences where it was clearly wrong. And then I try to remember those things so that when I'm when I'm getting advice from my mind, I can say, oh, like that one time when you told me this and I spent a whole year going down that path and it turns out it wasn't true. Like that time, I, I should listen to you because you were right that time because you weren't. And so I started like that's something tangible you can do. Start noticing when your mind gives you bad information and don't judge yourself. Just know that your mind is filling in the blanks. That's its job. That's what it does when you don't have enough information, it fills in the blanks. Um, but the reason you don't have enough information is probably because you're not, it's not because you're not listening to your mind because the information isn't there. It's, it's, a, it's a processor, right? It's a computer. Hmm. Um, it's because you're not present in your body, you're not paying attention. Like when I was driving my car, I'm not looking around me or I would have just made intelligent, you know, optimal choices, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, instead I'm, I'm checked out and so I'm listening to this external uh, authority telling me what to do. So if you if you start noticing that and gathering that up and uh, start having a little bit of doubt and that your mind is right, and that'll lead you in really healthy healthy directions. I love that. So it, it's right here. It's like I want to cue that first video that we ever made, the uh, the train story. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because uh, it's just such a great video. I I feel like. I've thought about that video and that message in because it's so concrete. The beautiful thing about it is it's like it's so easy to remember that lesson from such a simple story. I mean, it's it's literally I probably I've brought it up in my own head at least once a week since we did it. Like that's how tangible it is. I, I feel like I almost want to like refilm it and like live action and like do the whole thing, you know? Because it's such a powerful, like, I wish everyone on earth could watch that video one time <laughs> because it's so beautiful. Well, yeah, cue it up. Go ahead and play it. I want to tell the story about when I first really understood what Spirit Mind is. And it's kind of funny because it actually happened uh, here in Tokyo in a train station. And I, had, I was with my wife, Hisami, and I'd met Hisami uh, just a few years before. I'd been teaching for a long time and I had this really wonderful life where I was living my dreams and... Um, doing spiritual teaching and really helping people be happier and, and live a more joyful life. And so I thought I kind of had it figured out. And then I met Hisami and she's just so amazing and so beautiful. And our, our first date, and we don't speak the same language, uh, she speaks Japanese, I speak English. And our first date, I'm connecting with her and it's so beautiful. I'm looking at her eyes, I'm looking at her energy and we're holding hands and we're um, just hanging out together and laughing. and. It's just such an amazing, beautiful time. Like this is what, this is why we married her, right? Because this is like, this is the best thing ever. The most happiest moments I ever had were just, you know, hanging out with Yusami. And so we're in Tokyo and we're, we're headed home and we're at the train station. I'm just thinking like my goal, I just want to get home so I can have that beautiful time with my wife because I don't really like riding the train. And so I'm like, I'm starting to think about and start to get stressed out. Like, okay, what time's the train coming in? And like, okay, so the express train takes uh, seven minutes, but it's coming three minutes later. And then the, the regular train, the local train is gonna take 15 minutes. And so I'm trying to figure it all out in my head. 
And then he saw me and taps me on the shoulder, just tap, tap, tap. And I look at her and she's all bright and beautiful and, and having a peaceful time. And I'm all stressed out. And she says, is there somewhere you need to go? And I was like, what? what is she talking about? And I just kind of was like, no, no. And then she taps me on the shoulder again. And she says, is there something you have to do when we get home? And I was like, wait, I want to get home and have a good time with you. And then she taps me on the shoulder again. And then she says, well, you know, the express train is really stressful. We're standing up and it's not comfortable, but the local train, we can relax on it, sit down and enjoy our time together. And all of a sudden I got it. I was like, oh, wow, that thing I want to get to, that beautiful moment, that beautiful time with my wife that I want to have, I can have right now. And, and, so, and we did, we got on the train, we sat down. And it's the first time that I ever enjoyed being on the train. In fact, the whole train disappeared. I was just connecting with her and looking in her eyes and we're laughing and having a good time. It, it, the time just went by. I just loved it. And then we got home and we're having that beautiful moment that I wanted, but it started on the train. It continued through the whole journey home. And I was like, wow, this is amazing because I started realizing, I think uh, all throughout my life, this is happening. I'm trying to get to that beautiful moment. I'm trying to use my brain to think my way to figure out how to make a beautiful moment. And here's my wife who's living in that beautiful moment all the time. And this is really what, uh, this is what material mind and spirit mind is. I was using my material mind to try to make a better life for myself. And Hisami was naturally living in her spirit mind where she was just living an always beautiful life in every moment. And the longer I spent with her, I realized that like, she eats like that. I eat in a very stressed out way, trying to figure out what the right nutrients are and what I'm supposed to do and how to get it down fast and <laughs> everything. And she just, she just tunes in and, and just eats what she wants and she loves it and it's perfect. And uh, my whole life, I realized even my most successful parts, I'm living in a really stressful way. And so of course, in the last five years, that's what I've been changing is putting more and more of the spirit mind together. And that's why I'm so excited about this training is because I wanna take that and get it to everyone. This always beautiful life that Isami lives. And Isami actually means always beautiful, literally. That's her, uh, the kanji characters in her name. This always beautiful life, I wanna bring that to everybody because it changed me. It changed me from being a successful, stressed out person with little beautiful moments that I was creating into a person that was just having a beautiful life all the time, even in the hard moments, having a beautiful life. And that's what I want to give uh, for you too. Before we, we wrap up, I guess I've, I've got like a couple last questions. One of them is, is there anything big right now that you just feel like would be really good to share or something that you've been thinking about that, um, you think is really relevant right now and to give you that context of the people that watch this this whole fulfillionaire thing is um, a lot of us have left like lives behind of looking for money or fame or success uh, those metrics of success rather and looking towards this everyday journey of like what do I want to do today what's really important to me and really looking for that fulfillment and fulfillment doesn't always mean uh, like bliss and smiles. Sometimes it means hard things that lead to great things. And sometimes it means, uh, you know, doing absolutely nothing for the day. You know, I hope people find a lot of fulfillment in just taking some of the advice you've given on here, some of the recommendations and trying it. Yep. So the question is, is there anything big or relevant that you're thinking of right now that you'd like to share? Oh, okay. Or, yeah. 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 So the um, the thing that, that I think is really relevant right now, <clears throat> uh, especially in the United States, but but really everywhere, is that right now we're we're seeing a lot of conflict among people. So we're seeing a lot of like an escalation in you know my beliefs are right and your beliefs are wrong, and this, it's been building for a while, but we're really getting, you know, it's coming to a head right now, uh, even in, in violent ways. <clears throat> that's part of the transition that we're going through. So that's part of the breakdown of uh, this mental model and scarcity and so on. So we're moving more into a spirit mind world. But it's, it's really important to pay attention to it right now because it's so easy to get dragged in. So for me, it's it's easy for me to be uh, feeling really good and then think, oh, I think I'll check in on, uh, on uh, you know, COVID-19 and see what's going on. Or, 
well, I'll check in on the elections in the U.S. and kind of see, you know, what's going on or the politics and the news and and just touching into it for a little time. It's easy for that divisiveness to get stirred up inside us and inside me. And it's it's hard because it leaves us in a place of feeling disconnected from, you know, half the population and from or or more like that. I'm I'm here and there's you know so many other people, but I can't relate to them or connect with them or I think they're wrong or they think I'm wrong. Um, but you can step out of that pretty easily. So the trick is to start to see that just <clears throat> see people as people instead of seeing them as their beliefs and you as your beliefs. And if you can move out of the, the mind and into a more compassionate space, that things will really shift. And if we, the reason I bring it up is that if we can't do that, if we keep going down the road that we're on right now, we're just going to see a continued escalation of violence and, and social unrest and difficulty, but it doesn't need to happen. We don't have to get, we don't have to escalate into more chaos. Uh, we could, uh, we could give each other a hug, you know, <laughs> instead of hitting each other in the face <laughs> to make yeah. a, you know, a bad example. But, uh, um, so just notice when that's happening inside you, because that's that's where it starts. So um, even if your actions are under control, and when you talk to people, you say words that feel connecting, and you take actions that are nonviolent, <clears throat> that's great. But if you're still having those thoughts inside, if you're still feeling superior to other people and judgmental about their beliefs and angry that they could possibly like that person or dislike this person, if you're having those thoughts inside, you're part of the problem. You're circulating that energy inside you and you're amplifying it. Now, hopefully most people listening here, it's not, you know, it's not spreading through your words, your deeds, but it's spreading through your energy. And if, if you're a conscious person and you're spreading that energy, imagine all the people that are less conscious, you know, they're spreading it too. And if there's, if you can't do it, if you can't change inside you and choose to stop circulating this device of energy, there's no hope that anybody else can either. <laughs> right? So, you know, if you're listening, that's the most important thing is let that wind down inside you. And the way to do that is you need to fill yourself up with something positive. You need to fill yourself up with something that brings you joy and love and happiness and focus on it and, to, and just let that other thing die down. Let that noise resolve. There is no answer that you're going to come up with in your mind for this. that's going to solve this issue of divisiveness. So you need to just fill up with something else and let that, let that question just fade away. That's the, that's the number one uh, most important thing we're working on right now. Wow. And the, that's so incredibly relevant uh, to me personally. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I told you this, but last year I started a group called the President's Club with a couple of other incredible people that I had met before. And then in, they they were all in Croatia at Mindvalley University. And we've been on uh, weekly or biweekly politics calls ever since uh, studying to be future potential uh, presidential candidates. Right. And as a piece of that, you know, this is all so relevant because the like I went to the the single largest BLM rally that was in Washington DC I felt very uh it was almost impossible for me not to go I actually drove halfway across the country to go to Washington DC to go to this protest not to march with them or anything but to film and document and see like what was happening and why it was happening and you know obviously as everything has gone more and more and more I've gotten way more educated and really tuned in to all the information and, and incidents and things. And it does not make any sense. You know, uh, it's such a chaotic situation that uh, I'm so glad you said that now because I really need to look at the way I've been processing all these things. And I, I'm constantly trying to like ground and center and, and come to peace. And basically my only solution has been to not pay attention to it. But then... I think you feel neglectful. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's a careful balance. So yeah, I'm, I'm not, I should be, you know, give a little caveat. I'm not saying that 
people shouldn't be protesting. I think it's really important that people are protesting right now. Um, but that can be done from a, a different space. It can be done from a space of, I love my country, I love my planet, I love my fellow human beings. And so I, I want to create, a, I want to help create a world that's where everybody can be happier, where everybody can get along better, whether we don't have all these uh, really harsh inequalities that we have right now. So that's a, that's a beautiful intention. And that's, that's worth fighting for. Uh, the, the part that we want to calm down is I'm, I'm sort of talking from the sideliners like me where I'm, you know, I'm in here in Tokyo, so I'm not, I'm not in the marches, but it's easy to tune in and get angry about like the responses and this, all the, you know, it's, there's a lot of stuff to get frustrated about right now. So we got to kind of keep our eye on the ball, you know, the ball <laughs> and the ball is creating that happier space for everybody. And, uh, that starts with me. If I, if I get upset for a week and I'm really grumpy because I've been upset about watching the news, that's not aiming toward that goal. You know, that's take that's going back there. That just means I get distracted into the noise. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. What a, what a good time for spirit mind stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's good time for, for the practices. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, thank you. I'm really excited. Uh, so you said the timeline on Spirit Mind on this thing that everyone's going to be excited about after this now is like a few months. Yeah, I think we're we won't finish it in in 2020, but it should be, you know, not very far into 2021. Is there a like a, a list or somewhere we can go? To sure. Get yeah, you can go to my website. Um, easiest way, uh, you can go to www.jeffreyallen.love. And that'll get send you to my website, <laughs> and uh, yes. and yeah, and you can get on, uh, you can sign up for the free energy starter kit or you know anything else, and that'll get you on on my personal list. I don't send very very many emails, but uh, you will get one when uh, when we release the Spirit Mind training. Yeah, awesome. I, I think Beautiful. you can also go to spiritmind.com. There's just a simple landing page where you can put in your email, and you won't get anything except for the invitation to the class. So that's that's a oh, maybe perfect. A, Easier way, yeah, spiritmind.com. And then um, is there anything else? Uh, do you have any questions for me or, or anything you'd like to talk about before we wrap up? Um, feels pretty complete. If, if I kind of check out the energy of who's, who's going to see this, I would say uh, the biggest thing that I see is People are, people watching are looking for more confidence. So there's a, there's a sense there of, oh, I want to have this level of confidence, this level of information, but it's, I have this right here. And the only thing I would say to that is, it's okay, wherever, wherever you are, just be authentic. And you're gonna find that to be way more empowering than, uh, you know, trying to be trying to be in a place where you think you should be instead of being in a place where you are. Yeah. But uh, otherwise it looks looks great, Skip. All the everything looks really complete. Yeah.